Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen, on this 59 degree afternoon, which was supposed to be 70. Somebody didn't pay the electric bill to Mother Nature. It's not going to stop us. All right. Today's episode's called The Question Why. I wrote an article a long time ago that absolutely addressed all this. And I can't believe I forgot it, especially when searching through my brain for new episode ideas. But the cool thing is, at my smoke shop yesterday, we had four guys in their young 20s come in and extremely inquisitive, extremely intelligent, very well-mannered, and we had, uh, geez, three of three others of the older guys in our 40s, uh, two of us in our 40s and one of them in mid, uh, I guess, mid-60s. And one of the kids kept coming up with this stress of why. Why any of the conspiracies that exist? Which is obviously a fantastic question. And something that is sort of a knee-jerk response when you kind of get past the first level of shock. Let's say you're willing to walk inside the door of any one conspiracy just to look around. You, you don't believe it yet. In fact, you feel the need to tell others that you don't believe it as you walk in. And you're sort of walking into a saloon. If you need a visual metaphor. And there are people already there. And the question would be, why are you here? Why do you believe this? And then the explanation is sort of a Pandora's box. Or maybe it's Schrodinger's cat. Is the cat dead or is it alive? It's been put into space. We don't know. The idea is you must, if, if you're going to play the scenario of trying to solve for why, then you must satiate with an answer that that person who's asking the question can understand. Because you could answer the question 100%, but if they don't understand it, nothing they can do. Now, the different personalities were phenomenal. Inside there, we had a sniper pilot, very good for flat earth. We had a political science major, and then uh, two just guys that didn't really talk about what they were doing. Uh, one of them seemed to be sort of a automotive expert. Not sure what the other one is. He kept kind of quiet. But we got a lot of questions. We got the really good question about, okay, uh, you know, the flat earth community says that the earth is a round disk. Why? Why would anyone, and, and they're saying, you know, that the government is actually trying to convince us it's a ball. Why? 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 And there's really dozens of answers one could give. But any answer would be a guess, right? And again, why is a very subjective thing. There should be a, well, there is a black and white answer for all things, but only the universe knows the, those answers, right? We have a lot of inside jobs and false flags around the world where people are killed. Governments setting up a chain of events to control a narrative so that the public is scared into a particular condition, problem, reaction, solution. We're pretty sure the wise in most cases, but sometimes they get so complex and they get so intense that it's hard to say. There's not just one why. There's a bunch of whys. Why? Because they wanted to do this and they wanted to do that and they wanted to do this because these are, these are the things that happened after that event that were only made possible through a false flag. Increasing freedom and sovereignty never being one of them, Right. But for us old guys who are extremely well-researched, especially in the last probably, you know, five years of our life every day, just ingesting metric tons of information and trying to sift through it, listening to these kids tell us what they're being taught was actually more informative than anything else. Arguing from the position that their schools did not teach them certain concepts and therefore it can't be true. Very interesting. I'll tell you this much, it was very useful to have done 170 plus episodes, probably five of which you haven't even seen yet, so 180 plus whatever, the five, six special reports. 
Now, I've talked about several times this sort of spectrum, this threshold of belief, where we have on one side thoughts that go through our brain that make us feel utterly and completely euphoric. Now, in most cases, those that spectrum, the limit uh, in that direction starts to grow sort of a glass barrier that comes back towards center, meaning this. Most adults do not have the ability to come down a staircase at Christmas morning and ever feel like it, they did when Santa Claus was believed to be real in their mind. We lose that capability of ingesting magic to that a miracle degree, depending on what kind of family you grew up with, right? So we can't get back to the utter spectrum that we're born with. It's probably a telltale sign of how screwed up we've allowed the world to be. Now, the other side is actually very interesting because how much horror does a human being ever conceive of? There's two answers to that. There are people that will believe that horror is something that a child knows as soon as the lights go out, and then there's a lot of us that believe that it's indoctrinated into us, that there is no, other spec there is no spectrum on the other side, that we're taught to be afraid, taught to be racist, taught that something is in the dark. It would be interesting to raise a child from scratch and never joke about the dark, never let him see anything that would be evil coming out of the dark, and see if you could raise a child completely out of the fear of the dark. Never make a joke. Physically, verbally, whatever. Now, I would say that the opposite is true for the dark side, which is that potentially, as you get older, you invent more darkness. And it goes from sort of an irrational monster underneath the bed to having children and, I guess, worrying about their well-being, uh, enjoying your own mor uh, mortality, enjoying being alive, and then fearing your mortality, I should say. And so, with that spectrum of thought, from euphoria to one side and absolute terror on the other side, we find comfortable spaces in the middle, and we try to take vacations towards the euphoric side. Theoretically speaking, with adrenaline as our companion in life, a lot of us, you know, will get on roller coasters or you ride motorcycles really fast and you get the adrenaline. However you get it to pop out, it pops out. But this word, why? What is that? I mean, we all are familiar with the word and its use in the in English language, but I'm going to propose to you something different here. Now, there's several uses for the word why. Of course, one is sort of a, a pickaxe of reality. We want to know why things happen. Any indication of why something happened. And we're eager for the answer. We're not trying to fight someone away with it. So, you find something in disarray. You find something even euphoric. And you're walking in the room and you can't ex explain why it happened to you. And you're just saying, you know, why did you do this for me? Or why did you do this to me? Someone's unfaithful to you. And you really just want the answer. You really, really want the answer. Why stress that? Because the opposite is also true. Some people use why as a defense mechanism for their consciousness. There's something called TMS. I've mentioned it a couple times on the show. I'm going to mention it right now because it really shows you the inner, inner brilliance and mechanics of the human mind. TMS is... A huge long name, but it has to do with the fact that uh, if your mind is dealing with a psychosis that is, or a traumatic event in your past, past that is coming back to haunt you, for whatever reason, you can't store it anymore and it keeps kind of creeping up towards your consciousness, your brain will s uh, randomly select muscle tissue in your body and strangle the oxygen supply, the blood supply, everything to that muscle and give you phantom pain. A lot of people have back pain. They get x-rays. There's nothing wrong with them. But they know they have the back pain. And let me tell you, they really do have the back pain. But it's created by the fact that there's a thought coming into their brain and their brain distracts them by creating this pain. There's even a MASH episode on it. Alan Alden's character had back pain. It was all because he just kind of lost his mind when it came to being stuck in North Korea. So why is sort of more of a more conscious, subconscious way of sort of defending 
the need to walk down a darker path. It also is a result of probably competing logic due to indoctrination or knowledge, meaning the good stuff and the bad stuff. But one of the gentlemen was asking a really good question. He said, look, forget all your physics and all that stuff, whether it's round or flat or whatever. The real interesting thing is the pivot point. Why did anyone go from believing it's flat to believing it's round? And then why, right now in the 21st century, 2017, was supposedly all this science, all these uh, space stations and satellites, are they now saying it's flat? You know, the internet. There was a really funny moment where I said, well, you know, in the International Space Station, they've never pointed the camera at the moon, which is sort of a telltale sign that the set doesn't support it. And they literally said, well, maybe no one's requested such a thing. So now here's the thing. On this show, you know, the only, only, the only people trying to say it's flat is the, are the citizens of the world. We're trying to dig back into the physics or the science, the electricity, everything that would explain it being one way or the other. To try and say, well, what would we really see? How high do you have to be to see the curvature of the earth? And one of the kids in this bunch, who's the pilot, he had flown up 74,000 feet. Now, I guess you're supposed to be uh, 80 miles up before you really start seeing any curvature. He thought he saw some curvature. It's not really that high up, you know. Divide that by 5,280 and then divide that by 7,900, and that's the percentage off the surface of the planet you are. It doesn't really seem like it's possible. 80 miles. That's as far up as you have to be, minimum, to start seeing the curvature of the Earth. But they'll convince themselves they're seeing it. But why? Why is a defense mechanism it is very interesting? Well, let's look at the anatomy of a conspiracy theory, and then let's bring back our little friend, why? And prior to doing that, let's do a small example of what why would be used in a normal scenario. Let's say we're, uh, we're roommates... You go on a little one-week excursion. I got the house to myself. You come back, and the whole house is dressed in Scottish plaid. And you are stunned. The carpet, the wallpaper, all the furnishings are all covered in this uh, scotch tape plaid, right? And you walk in the room, and you're like, what the hell, dude? Is this a joke? Why would you do that? And either I say, yeah, it is a joke, or, man, I've always wanted to do this, and I just got a deal on plaid. But I'm going to give you a pretty black and white answer. As absolutely confusing as this is, I'm going to give you an answer. But now, let's take a look at a normal conspiracy on the Internet, which is that something starts to evolve slowly. You know, it's, uh, we're still not sure whether or not conspiracies come out of, you know, a lot of them come out of ancient past where people have been hanging on to these alternate theories for, geez, hundreds of years. And the internet has simply given them an opportunity to sort of peel the sticker off and so you can, everyone can see it, you know. But it slowly grows and a few YouTubers get lucky and they jump on it. Maybe some folks with already tens of thousands of subscribers jump onto it. And then, whoa, we're totally interested. There's an AM radio show called Coast to Coast AM, hosted currently by George Norrie. Used to be hosted by Art Bell. But that whole show is all about conspiracies, from Bigfoot to everything. Aliens of all kinds. And you can go on that show as a guest and pretty much claim anything that you want. So in this nebulous crawl of a conspiracy into the reality of the world, into the consciousness of man, it's gaining the spin of every person who passes the story along. It's gaining research from every single person who's interested. One person runs off in one direction, one person runs off in the other direction. They don't know each other. They don't necessarily bring it back, but eventually a third person watches both their videos and brings it into a third interpretation. Plus, they have their own DNA. 
By the time you find this Frankenstein conspiracy theory, it doesn't have any true beauty and form. It is a very chaotic idea, especially in terms of flat earth, right? But what if the morsel of its existence actually refers to the truth? You can see it. You look right down inside of it and you can see the truth, right? Now what do you do? What do you do when you're looking into this chaos? You're like, oh my God, there it is right there. It's almost just like trying to fish something out of a soup bowl. But it's chaotic, it's moving, and you can't quite grab it, and you don't have the right tool, and it's too hot, or whatever. And then someone walks up to you and says, what are you doing? And you're like, ah, oh, man, there's this thing right here. It's in this theory right here, and I'm trying to, there's some truth in here. At least that there would seem to be some truth in here, and I'm trying to extract it. And they're like, well, what's, the, what's that again? Now, back up. What are you talking about? Oh, you know, it's like there's there's all this crazy, weird contradictions between heliocentric round Earth and flat Earth as reinvented as a disk with ice barrier. Man, there's stuff that's for it. There's stuff that's against it. And I'm trying to pull out the stuff that's sort of the smoking gun for either side. And see that little red dot right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the one. It's a flat Earth smoking gun. I want to get it out of there by itself, leaving behind the people that even brought it to my attention because I want to look at it a little closer. And without helping the process, right? Without getting involved and trying to say, well, I, you know, I've got this little pocket knife. I get it out of there in two seconds. People will start to cave on the theory itself, right? Their, their brain just goes to absolute critical mode and they say, why? Why would anyone, you know, how could this possibly be? You know, of course we know it's a ball. And I go, well, you know, again, there's this whole other thing coming out. It's the old theory reemerging, and Neil deGrasse Tyson isn't helping, and NASA isn't helping, and JPL isn't helping. People seem to be lying constantly about being in space, at least with human beings, human flesh. Now, you have a choice at that point. You can go into the science of it all and bring what you've been taught, and wherever the hell you learned it, and try to sit there and go, okay, well, let me teach you something about geometry and da 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 and you see this say why don't you, I'm gonna go on the other side of your yard and you hold a laser and you know we'll prove this right here and right now instead of doing that which requires a lot of empirical knowledge a lot of data and something that can be recreated in the observable world there's sort of this I don't know I want to say cowardice because it is but there's this position you can take to essentially say I don't want to deal with this and it's just the little three-letter word, why. And then, you know, why can go into, you know, we're looking for black and white answers to things, but on some levels, why would need existential understandings of the universe? It would require that you understand a lot of motives of individuals in the world. And if you haven't learned about the organizations that would lie to you, and then I'm trying to tell you that they're the reason why you believe stupid things in the world. Because they've indoctrinated you. Again, I will always remind you, we need a better phrase for this, but when people find out they've been gullible, when they've been had, when they've been deceived, it's, it's something that they defend because it really makes them realize how gullible they are. When you're young, you're always trying to form an opinion about yourself, Right? You want to know that you're smart. And the only way that we really give out accolades is memorizing and repeating. Right? Go to school, memorize and repeat. Which means that you are an absolute whore of indoctrination. You know, imagine that you were a piece of cellophane. Oh no, tinfoil. You're a flat plane when you're pulled out. But then I say, okay. If you go to Harvard... What's going to happen is there's a, uh, there's a little bear right there, and we're going to take your tinfoil, and we're going to smash it around the bear, and then we're going to melt the bear out or pull the bear out, and then you'll be in the shape of a bear. But you're going to go to this other school, Princeton, and we're going to have a bunny rabbit. We're going to shape you around a bunny rabbit, and then we're going to pull the bunny rabbit out, and you're shaped like a bunny rabbit. You are shaped and molded by whatever philosophy, indoctrination, methodology that these schools actually push you into. doesn't matter what school you go into. 
Some of those schools are absolutely phenomenal. They are known for producing original thinkers. Harvard's one of them. The Ivy League schools of the world, except like Purdue University, who was a co-conspirator on 9-11, you know, a lot of them will teach you how to open your brain. They'll make everything easy for you, and you just fall uphill the rest of your life. It's very interesting. you got to work your ass off, but they'll make it easy as long as you follow the rules. But it was very interesting to hear how you know, why drew out so many different opinions. And that really questioned, just so you know, the question was last night, why would anyone say the world is flat after all these years of it being a globe? And I should note that there's a theory out there that someone submitted that, which I think is utter, utter horseshit, but the guy, uh, I forgot his name, he was trying to say that the, that the idea that the world believed that it was flat is a recent theory that is not really something that goes back in history very far. And if you simply look at the books from different religions that go back a long time, by the time someone has the ability to scribe in a book, whether it be an etched piece of wood printed on book or whatever, a photoreal beautiful drawing of either flat earth or heliocentric, which again, there's more flat earth models from all walks of life, I mean, all religions, um, that means that that belief system has been around for an extremely long time, right? Now, I will remind you, the Egyptians thought it was a ball. And they even understood the orbits around the sun as being a year and the orbit of the moon around the earth as being a month, because that's what their hieroglyph symbols of such things look like. But still, flat earth has been around for a very, very long time. But the idea is now, you know, we, we have all kinds of scientific instruments. You know, I happen to believe satellites are real. I've had at least two friends of mine complete uh, very prestigious projects working on satellites. And I guarantee you, they are, with their, with, no one would be paying them, okay, to sit in a room doing nothing, especially at the levels that they were paid. Uh, the government's wasteful, but they're not that wasteful. But what's interesting is is that I was able to, to get into Flat Earth without really worrying about the question why. Because I'm way past defending my soul and defending my heart. And maybe that's to my credit and maybe that's to my demise. I'm not sure. What struck me amazing about it was that I was, I was thinking, wow. You know, I never have, you know, questioned the research of it being round or flat. Why do you think it's flat again? You know, and I went through the different things. But that was a why that was related to the question of just gathering information and not being defensive. When you talk about the moon missions, again, denial, anger, negotiation, and acceptance, right? The denial part about the moon, which I actually heard recently from a good friend of mine, he said, you know, I just don't see how they could get, you know, keep all these people in on it. That's one of the biggest defense mechanisms about the moon missions. The funny thing is it's a, a presumption that a bunch of people are actually in on it. There weren't a bunch of people in on it. Why do you think the props look so silly half the time? Because not a lot of people were in on it. If the props they could have created in laboratories telling people that it was actually going to reach its destination, those look pretty good. Of the props that would reveal the hoax, they look pretty silly. The anger phase would be the why phase. Why would anybody do that? I mean, really, why, why, why? Now, again, you have to give some credit. But the subtext of why is really sort of the indicator as to whether or not you should spend one moment of your life trying to answer the question or not. Because if someone is asking why to simply know, they're looking at you with big open eyes, they never lose focus on you, or the information you're presenting, whether it be a video or book or something, and they're attempting to ingest information, and they stay level-headed. In fact, some, some of us, you know, uh, it's the challenge of being convinced. 
And of course, that's a dangerous state of mind to be in because you could actually want to be convinced. And boy, you'll get there. However you uh, think you won't, you will. And then there's the opposite. The why that means shut the fuck up. I'm not ready for this. And then if you start talking, you're wasting your breath. Now, if you're a person who has a fairly open mind and you've been down several rabbit holes in your life of which you believe have revealed truths hidden through indoctrination and manipulation and propaganda or all the above, once you find a single piece of truth that was hidden from you, you, your appetite for such things becomes ferocious. You're like, whoa, I just wanted the truth, and these assholes have been lying to me my whole life like I'm some child that can't handle the truth. Yeah, you contemplate why. But the more that you become informed about the fabric of this planet and the humanity that is uh, seemingly non-empathetic, self-serving, very immature as a matter of fact, very underdeveloped despite their money we we tend to we tend to overestimate the value of money as it applies to intellect as it applies to understanding the human condition hey i will say i've met people who are absolute fucking machines when it comes to making money and they are utterly dedicated and they they never breathe they never smell the roses they make money when they want to make money and they make almost exactly the amount of money that they want to make i mean it's phenomenal but i if someone said you think that person's living a real life i'd say hell no they're living that weird thing that they but they seem to love it so there you go but some people are asking why Sort of like the, the why that you hear in, in really crescendo moments in movies where someone's died. And there's nothing to answer. They died. They took a risk. They did something as a hero. And they lost their life. And their body's lying on the ground. And someone comes up to find them. And the camera's on them. And it's why, 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 why? There's no answer there. It's merely a, an act of a lack of a better word. You, there's, there are no words, and so you simply just say, you know, why did life turn out like this? So, I'm either preaching to the choir, or I'm preaching to virtually no one. Because those who would ask the question why, who are really in a sort of a passive self-defense action to say, I, I want to short, cir short circuit your mouth from saying any more about these things that bother me. Or they think you're an idiot. I guess I should throw that one out there too. They feel utterly comfy in the fairy tale story of life that is taught to them through universities. They're good people. And they can't come contemplate someone being a bad person. That's the funniest goddamn thing on planet Earth. Young kids that have never dealt with corporate America, young kids that have never dealt with billionaires politicians, you know, your upper, upper class people. They've never sat in a backyard and had tea with an upper, upper class person. And even if that particular person is chill, uh, they'll talk to you about the actions of others at their level and it will be mortifying to you. A lot of times that comes out in the form of their own history as a family. That's how I experienced it myself. Sat in the backyard of an unbelievable home, talking to an unbelievable man. And uh, he and his son just continued telling me about their family. And they had managed to relax, and they had managed to become very ethical at the end of their family generation. But boy, you just go back about 100 years and, whew, something else. But that was a, such a rare situation that I was involved in that circle and that was all probably over by the age of, I'd say, 21. Those interactions. Well, it's been quite a, quite a few years. I've lived more years than that after that moment, and I've not had that experience again. And I've been with several extremely wealthy, very powerful people since then, but no one at that level. No one at that upper, upper echelon level. 
So how do you do a brain dump to someone who is whying you away? You know, it's really sort of a, as the old saying used to go in the 90s, it was kind of a talk to the hand situation. So how do we deal with people who say why is the final section in this essay. Well, on one level, you don't. You let them live their lives. They either become part of the problem or part of the solution. One of the kids was, was uh, very, very positive about humanity and saying that he, you know, he couldn't believe. Uh, it's it's the you know, uh, I can't believe defense, which we talk about on the show in season one a lot. Well, I can't believe. Well, I can't imagine. It's nothing to fucking do with reality, man. Nothing to do with it at all. But he said, you know, I can't believe that these people, all these people at the top of the world are so corrupt. And I'm sitting there going, kid, fuck, just look at Hillary Clinton for fuck's sake. And you're telling me that there's any question on planet Earth that people are fucking evil to the absolute nines? Go look up Lolita Island and Bill Clinton's 26 visits, five of which didn't have Secret Service. And look at what Lolita Island's all about. These people got to run the most powerful country in the world doing things that are absolutely unspeakable in any country. Unified taboos across the fabric of humanity, and these people do it every chance they get. And so I looked at the kid and I said, look, we just remember, you're not, in, you're not on any list, man. He's like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, if there's an apocalypse, you don't have a past to Vault 44. You don't. You're going to be out here eating fucking, you know, nuclear bombs, trying to tell yourself how amazingly ethical these people are. Because that's the fairy tale Santa Claus in the morning fucking life you wanted to live. I think the way that we approach discussing the sort of denial why, the I can't believe defense, is to say, well, I wouldn't try unless you had somehow an amazing amount of respect by the individual you're going to try to engage. Because all that will happen after that, after you begin trying to discuss what you believe to be compelling arguments one way or the other, is that they don't consider you part of their clan. You're not really a part of their tribe, and you're definitely not a respected elder in the village that's inside their brain. And so you'll be wasting your effort. You give it a couple answers. But I'm going to tell you right now, once someone says why when discussing a conspiracy theory, try to figure out whether or not they are hungry for information why, or if they're in denial why. Now I'm going to tell you again, I think that most people that are hungry for information, they don't say why. They just go at the information. I don't know if that's the way we should do it. Should we jump straight in and, and just say, okay, you say the world's flat. And, all right, all right, fine. Tell me how it works. What was funny was that uh, they, they've they heard the whole thing. I mean, they've heard their friends you know, go down the path of uh, flat earth. They stayed heliocentric, which is just fine. That's pretty much where I am at this point. But again, there are some things that are very confusing about the claim it's round with some of the other things we've seen. So, by the way, I want to give you guys some kudos. A lot of you have come in, um, well, one, you continually watch my show, even though you understand I'm probably 51% round at this point. And you've been very kind to share your opinions about it and say, well, you know, I think it's flat and da 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 I really appreciate the fact that you're giving me the chance to vacillate back and forth you have to understand i you know if i were to say man gosh guys i feel like it's um or sorry if i say you know i'm 98 percent convinced it's flat i wouldn't stop researching it if i said that and if i were to say 98 percent certain it's round i continue researching it a little digression there but i wanted to say that but let me ask you this why is really going trying to get to the bottom of a motive. All right. Now, obviously, we can all agree that a motive is a very powerful mechanism by which to address information. You know, if someone gets murdered, the big question is, 
you know, why would anyone murder this person? And once we figure out the motive, well, well, okay, so the husband was beating the wife, the wife was sleeping with some other guy on the behind his back, there's the homicide motive. And then we all kind of put our head down at night and we feel good. But let's think about that, which is, you know, the, the idea of motive is typically referred to on some, you know, cop worship show. But when it comes to what shape the planet is, is there really a why? I mean, at its total perspective, sure. You know, it would either be the mathematics of the universe creating a ball, which is, again, everything we see in the sky is a ball. Every time we create zero gravity, uh, you know, vomit rockets and go up and down, up and down, everything does coalesce as a ball. So their, their gravity does exist. On this show, it's, it's ethereal wind, as Faraday and Tesla confirmed. But whatever, it exists. It's one of the weakest forces in the universe. There you go. Is there a why? Well, sure. Gravity exists, and that's why things turn into balls. Okay. Pretty good. Pretty damn good. How is this disc thing possible, right? The disc theory, it goes probably a couple fold. The disc would it would have to have a firmament, firmament over it to protect its occupants inside. Whether or not we're seeing out of the firmament and seeing stars in the distance, or whether or not the firmament itself is a sort of a starry paint job up there, well, that would be very intelligent design. We would be in a Petri dish if it's a flat Earth. We simply would, no matter how you think about it. It's either God created it, or aliens created it, or a more... I would say super species of mankind did it. And there's some sort of experiment going on inside, some sociological experiment to see how our species get along. Perhaps this is an incubation dish just like a petri dish. Okay. Think about it. We grow cultures inside these little dishes. Do you ever think for a second that maybe they have consciousness down there, little bacteria growing? What if they had consciousness? And, you know, you might grow a culture over the course of seven days. For you, it is seven days. For them, it might be seven billion years. We look up into the sky, and we see blackness with little pin lights at night. During the day, we have some sort of reflective atmosphere we can look at, whether it be blue or today for me, which is very overcast. There you go. This is sort of turning into a flat earth... uh, Mini series here, but I think you'll find this interesting. But let's just say, you know, our eyeballs believe that they can see into the depths of space. Our telescopes believe that they're looking into the depths of space, but perhaps wherever the hell we are, we're just looking at the top of our petri dish. Maybe it has a little dome over it to protect us. Maybe that dome is made of something that kind of reduces the amount of photons that come in our eyes. So for the most part, it's just, it's just black. Who the hell knows why it rotates? Either we're rotating down here or it's rotating up there. Maybe they understand with the type of creature they've put in this particular Petri dish. We do need the, uh, the oxygen to circle, right? I say I believe it's round because of expanding Earth. Well, maybe the very first ingredient they put down is the land. The second ingredient is... Some white people, some black people, some Asian people, some Mexican people, da, 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 some pygmies or whatever. And let's watch how they grow together. Or perhaps they just put one down. We walked around the planet and because of exposure to sunlight, which is this neat little mechanism that goes around. To them, it's seven days. To, uh, to us, it's an eternity. Because our little circuits are really small. And really small circuits can complete rotations a lot faster. The reason for that digression is to assert for one second that maybe why is an irrelevant question. But what, it's, what is its replacement? Its replacement is how. How do we get here? The main reason for making this episode goes like this. I want to make sure that if you're going to do anything, engage in any practice that is going to rob you of the reality that you live in. Because I will say that I think that young people are more inquisitive about reality now than they ever have been 
they're more existential today than they have been for a very long time. There's always these, uh, you know, these beatnik eras where people are really, hey, daddy oh, I'm really questioning the world, man. But we're at a we're at a renaissance of enlightenment. Whether or not we have any tools to do it, whether or not we have any truth to actually pull it off, I think we do. Would you really want someone to Hannibal Lecter your brain into some sad, shallow mechanism to defend a weak heart and simply be walking around going, why, 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 why? That's what little kids do. Little kids are mining data, though. If you were to write an artificial intelligence that was to emulate a human being, why would be a circuit loop Almost a binary book that comes out of the mouth of the computer when it simply says, in this area of discussion, I do not have enough data. My neural net is basically a stub, like a little, you know, pugtail of data. And I need to build a tree and I need to associate that tree with itself. And then I need to cross-reference that tree in my neural net to other trees. And so the question for a computer is why? But again, it's a data mining exercise for a computer. We can't let it be a defense mechanism. Yes, the birds behind me, which must be about a hundred of them, are on uh, our um, power lines. And they're having a rave. I can already see their little glow sticks. We just need one cat to run up the pool. So let me ask you a why. Why does it matter that the world wakes up? Why does it matter? Why can't people remain asleep? And life goes on. Weren't we pretty damn asleep in the 50s, 60s, and 70s? And, you know, many decades like that in the past. In the last hundred years, like I've said many times, do you really need to watch the news? Do you really need to know that someone was kidnapped in Russia? Maybe. In the past, it was very difficult for the ruling class to control us in every single nook and cranny of our existence. And now with the invention of the cell phone, they can control virtually every area of the world that has a cell phone in it. Partially they can, you know, just broadcast electricity into your home whether or not not you approve of it or not. Again, the the peak frequency of the planet Earth, if there were no electronics, no power supplies of any kind, is 32 hertz. That's it, man. 32. Not 32,000 or 32 billion, but 32 hertz. And now, without our permission, without the science being taught to the world, especially a bunch of politicians that basically have, you know, bachelor's degrees and things that don't matter, we have billions of hertz being broadcast us broadcast at us every single day our cell phones do it but let's go to a marshall McLuhan later think about the medium by which we look at the world we look at it through the lens of the medium by which we adjust what if you took away all the private for profit news organizations and cell phones would there be any protests right now in the world anywhere Probably not. Some of that can be dangerous because people can work underneath using conventional manners, infiltrate countries, start wars, all that good stuff. Man, I know you guys can hear this. It's crazy bird fest going on here. Bird rave. Sort of funny. What's really interesting about the exercise last night were the, the th- you know, was it one, two, three? Yeah, four gentlemen that came yesterday night. They're all part of the same generation. They're the generation that's going to take over. As the surprised elders of this planet right now, at least this very cognizant 40-year-olds, and again, one of our guys is in his mid-60s, who's just wide awake, man. We want to hand the baton off, like I said in a previous episode, right? Hand it down and say, guys, go, go, go. You're, you're to validate this, sure. But you'll find out we did a lot of work already. Let's go. Consequently, it's extremely similar to the initial Star Wars movie in 1977, Episode 4. 
You know, when Obi-Wan Kenobi meets Luke Skywalker through, you know, some happenstance, the kid has got a very myopic view of his world. He wants to go to school. He wants to be with his buddies, and his Uncle Owen won't let him. So he meets another old guy, and his old guy realizes, holy shit, you're Luke Skywalker. And we know it now, but back, you know, what he was going through as a character, as a fictional character, was this shit, this is the son of my nemesis and student, Anakin Skywalker, a.k.a. Darth Vader. And what happens in the little meeting at Obi-Wan Kenobi's hut? He pulls out a lightsaber, and he talks about the Clone Wars. He talks about the fact that his father was actually murdered by someone named Darth Vader. And right there, in that little tiny scene, you have a handoff from the old to the young, passing literally a lightsaber baton, which in one naive perspective is merely a weapon of of light but in a much deeper sense it's handing down the burden of battling the dark side because Darth Vader still exists and even though Luke Skywalker has no idea who Darth Vader is has no idea the guy wears a fucking mechanical suit and is almost eight feet tall and his destiny is wrapped up in this handoff you're young I can't, you know, continue. I can help you, Luke, but I can't fight your battle for you because this is your battle. What happens in the first episode? Obi-Wan sacrifices his life so he can become more effective on the other side. That's sort of what's going on right now in droves. Which is sort of walking into the room and saying, okay, guys, I know this is going to sound crazy. I know you've been uh, eating Captain Crunch every morning for the last 10 years. Worried about, you know, what uh, girl you're going to lure into your next sexual escapade. But in the end, you need to stop worrying about how many beers you drink, who you're trying to impress, because life doesn't care about any of those things. Life cares about what direction society as a whole is going. And you may not understand it now, but if you let society to go, continue to go in these misguided, propaganda-ridden directions... Your life won't last 10 years, 20 years. The success and happiness that us old guys were able to incur in the 80s and 90s, you'll never see it. Oh, by the way, our parents experienced, you know, five times as much happiness as we did. But you may never hear those stories. So hear them now. I understand you're at level one and you need to get to level 10 in order to survive in the way that you want it to survive. Beware of being convinced that less is more in all all cases. Less is more when it comes to spending money, for sure. But less freedom is not more freedom. Less empirical data about how the universe is held together is not more data. Right? Try not to fall victim to the why as the defense mechanism. In the denial phase of the Kubler-Ross model, ask it as a pickaxe to dig deeper. I think you'll find the world is a much better place in the end. If you start off a sentence, or you hear someone start off at a sentence, well, I can't believe, or I just can't believe, that's sort of a, a synonym phrase to why. To the why that's being used as a defense mechanism. And, you know, I want to say this. If you have someone asking why with a big eager grin on their face, then that is the let's begin a conversation why. If someone is asking why, sort of in that, uh, for lack of a better word, whiny voice, then they are trying to tell you that they're not prepared for the conversation. And you have to pick and choose whether or not you really want to go on with that because they're trying to tell you I'm not ready and there's nothing wrong with someone knowing that they're not ready right now I want to mention that the gentleman that asked the why last night we were able to give him some answers that he really liked and it's not like we know it empirically if we don't know it's fact but it's probably a, a potential idea and again the funny thing is I got stuck in the flat earth group when in my mind, you know, I'm, I'm more round than flat nowadays. 
for the time being anyway. I want someone to come up with an absolute smoking gun. Believe me. What I would love to see is, uh, you know, pictures at the Antarctica. I want to see pictures right at the wall. I want to see snow that goes whoop up on some crazy container like, you know, the edge of a smoked glass you might drink a beer out of or something. Or I want to see the cliff and the the ocean that's on the other side uh, with some indication that it's not anything you can see anywhere else. Maybe a lush jungle world right up next to, you know, an iceberg. That's the kind of smoking gun I want to see. We don't go into space, right? So we can't look down and see anything. We can't see any edges or anything like that. But I will say this much, and this is sort of a, a really positive footnote before I button this thing up with the, uh, the outro. If these four gentlemen are any indication of what's to come, I think we're in good hands. I think we're in good hands because, you know, at least two of them were extremely open-minded. I simply can't vouch for the other two. And I think that that's all you need. That's all you need. By the way, their report was that, and these guys are literally in their early 20s, I think, mid-20s at the oldest, but they said that they're, they pointed to their cell phones. They got a, they have, I, I have text messages all throughout my phone of people from my generation, my class, who believe the world is flat and they will not hear anything different. And I thought that was very surprising. Someone's going to have to address it at the scientific community level, right? And we know... We know what they're likely to say, so if they say all the likely things, then we're just going to blow it off. Yeah, 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 whatever. It's all good, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, if you made it this far, thanks for listening. If you dig the series, please subscribe. If you like this particular episode, give me a thumbs up. Always remember, it's a variety show. The official channels for Deep Thoughts Radio are facebook.com slash deepthoughtsradio. That's the page. The deepthoughtsradio.com is the site to get all of your feeds. You will notice that if you do click on the RSS feed, the podcast has been hosted over at mkultraradio.com. Again, that's a completely different show, but it's more like a it's more like a radio channel that has other shows in it. It was the intent. It hasn't been able to manifest as such, but Deep Thoughts Radio was first created under that umbrella. There's no legal uh, connection there. It's just um, if I move the podcast over to deepthoughtsradio.com I have to tell a bunch of different locations that that's what happened so I've just been uh, refraining from causing any disconnect for those who are loyal listeners on the podcast side of things so just understand if you go off to the um, or if you find on Facebook the deepthoughtsradio.com website or web page or whatever Facebook page it's very political very different than this so over here we're sort of the rebirth of thinking We're a hive mind. If you haven't picked up on it already, it's the comments that really glue the whole show together. I mean, you will read comments that will, I mean, if you're like me, you'll read comments that are so well-informed, your jaw's on the ground. Uh, I will say at least 25% of the episodes, at least, uh, were, were created due to comments. Either be straight up requests or just comments that are so fantastic, they... They were able to draw at least an hour out of content from me. That's all I got. Take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Overnight.